camera's not. Hello. Welcome to the Community Homeworks Workshop this evening. We're so glad you're joining us tonight. My name is Tiana Harrison, and I'm the Education and Volunteer Coordinator at Community Homeworks. If you're watching this live, please feel free to comment and let us know where you're tuning in from. Also, if you would like to join in on the discussion or ask questions, please put that in the comment section as well. If you're watching this after the live broadcast, we're still happy to answer your questions. It just may take us a little longer to respond. Community Homeworks is a nonprofit organization with the mission to empower homeowners to maintain safe, sustainable, and dignified homes. We get our fundings from grants, gifts, and donations. So if you find value in this workshop tonight, we encourage you to donate on our website at communityhomeworks.org. Tonight's workshop is titled Flooring Repairs, and our instructor is none other than the fabulous Mr. Paul Rutgers. We are so happy that you are here. Thank you for being here, and we look forward to learning more about floor repairs. Thank you, Tiana, and thank you, Jason. And we're rolling, right? This is my first time ever doing something like this where I'm wearing the Britney Spears mic, so bear with me. Um, I'm glad that I can't hear my voice in here, and I hope it sounds wonderful to those of you listening at home. Thanks for tuning in. And so I am second generation uh, floor guy. My dad is still uh, doing carpet. He started uh, 1967. Um, I started my first job was working in the warehouse at Megala in Kalamazoo when I was 15. Um, did some other things, worked in sales, uh, ended up working in installation. And since my dad and his brother uh, and one of my brothers were all carpet layers and we didn't have anybody in the family that did ceramic tile, hardwood floor and that kind of thing, I figured instead of competing with them, I would do the hard surface floors and get all their referrals and it worked out pretty well um, I don't work in that business anymore I'm a wood carver now but I became friends with Jason some years ago Jason Byler um, and a while ago Jason asked me to come and teach a class and you'll learn that I love to talk. So I said, sure. Um, and so this neighborhood, I had a lot of friends that lived in this neighborhood when I was growing up. Um, my grandpa lived not very far away in Millwood. Um, I love, I just absolutely love some of the houses in this neighborhood when they still took the time to, you know, not just build something, but build something nice. And so many of these homes are, you know, as they say, have good bones, right? They're they're good, solid houses, um, and that makes it a little bit easier when you're working on things. It can also make it harder when you're working on things. Because one is because everything's good and well built and solid. The other thing is, is because it's an older house, things have settled. So many cycles of humidity and dry and things moving. Um, but uh, another thing that you end up finding out is after World War II uh, is when we had the big movement of do-it-yourself. And there were so many new products that were new ways of doing things because after the war, there were so many of these new technologies that were out with plastics and aluminum and all this different thing. And people were quick just to throw something to the wall and see if it worked and market it really quick. Um, and so you had a lot of things that were done with products that they found out pretty quickly, maybe didn't last very well or methods that weren't the best. And a lot of it was being done by people who were sitting there with a, we didn't have the internet, right? And so they had a handyman magazine that they're following along and learning how to do things. And so um, you find a lot of you might find a lot of things that are um, a little wonky when you look and say, well, I, how do I deal with this? Because it was done a certain way. 
And so the one thing that I've learned is working on an older house versus um, a, a brand new house or a house built in the last 25 years, 30 years, um, is that most of your work and most of your potential problems are not going to be from actually putting in new floor. Um, they're going to be having to come up with a plan to learn how to deal with what's already there, either to remove it or to make it suitable and prepare it for what you're going to put over it. Um, and so that's where a lot of the questions typically come from is those type of things. So we have an outline um, that is um, covers a lot of things. In the past, uh, I think the first class that I did, um, I started to follow the outline and then I just found out that so many people had a lot of questions. Um, flooring is such a broad uh, such a broad subject, right? Because we have, you know, we have a concrete floor, we have wood floors. Uh, as far as a substrate goes, a substrate is the part of the house that you're putting the flooring on. Um, and so if I'm referring to a substrate, imagine if you tore all your flooring out, what's left, which is either going to be something like um, like this is OSB board or plywood or just planks um, or the concrete is what I mean by a substrate. Um, and so, uh, you know, to get everything down to the substrate, um, you might have multiple layers of things that are there already. Um, or you may have the original flooring that was in there. And so it can be, you know, a lot of variations. But um, I tend to just kind of ask people, why are you here? What are your questions? Um, do you have a specific need uh, or specific problem that you're dealing with? Or are you just looking to understand, um, you know, the way that Jason said when we were talking the other day was there are some people that they just want to know their house. And so uh, I find that the easiest thing to do and the way that we're able to make sure that everybody learns what they came to learn about is just to ask, what are you here for? What do you hope to learn? Do you have a problem you're looking to solve? And then uh, I guarantee you that we'll, um, that we'll get through all the questions um, and if you just want to know more about flooring, um, then you'll learn through this process, or it can also help you out and point you in the right direction to get more knowledge on that. Um, so, so I guess the uh, first thing is, is Lisa, why, why are you here, Lisa? Awesome. Okay. Okay. So just to um, make sure I understand you and to also uh, make sure that the people at home, um, you've got a house that was built in 1926. Um, some of it's beautiful hardwood floors, um, original hardwood floors. There are, uh, there was some ceramic tile that you had uh, put some snap lock flooring over there was a liquid underlayment put over it and the flooring is now buckling is the was the liquid underlayment the concrete is that coming loose or is the floor just buckling so it was a patch that the, so they used a patch instead of using a self leveling Well, 
Right. Okay. All right. So, um, so basically, it was uh, it was a substrate preparation that failed uh, or wasn't proper, which led to the floor failing. So the floor on its own probably would have been fine. Were it all things being equal, going over a flat surface. Okay, so she said that if she were to do it over again, she would take the time to pull up the ceramic uh, floor before and, and make it correct from that point. So, okay, so one, one point I want to make right away is um, to make the floor, your floor is only going to be as good as the substrate underneath it. And so this is an excellent example of that. And sometimes it's materials, but a lot of time it's just the amount of work to be done. And if you're doing it yourself, it's going to pay dividends to, to, to make that floor as perfect as possible. Although sometimes you can't make it perfect because of several reasons as far as height or um, a lot of other things. But okay, um, and so we will. Um, I'm going to write this on the board so I don't forget it. So, since this is going all over the World Wide Web, do you guys want to use like a code name instead of your real name when I write your name on the board? Okay. So you want um, so you want to learn more about um, getting the process of getting a floor uh, into better shape for putting. So we'll 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 do a sub straight preparation is your main thing that you'd like to learn. Is that correct? Okay, um, okay, am I allowed to like recommend people and stuff like that or, um, so Jason Jacobs at Real Wood Floors in Kalamazoo. I've known for a long time, does amazing work. Um, I'm sure there's other people out there that do great work too, but he's the person I've got the most experience with. He's dependable, he's professional, um, and his work is just amazing. Okay, Jessica, what brings you here? Actually, once can I turn on the mic that they can, and then I'm not repeating everything? I'm interested in knowing uh, more about the subfloor or substrate, specifically moisture barrier. All right, so. And uh, same as Lisa, I will be uh, refinishing hardwood floor section. Okay. And also hardwood floor refinishing. Okay. Can I? Tiana, what are your questions or what are you hoping to learn or gain from our class tonight? Similar to the other participants, I am looking to find out about refinishing um, hardwood floors. Okay. And how, T-I? T-I-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. So, 
So also hardwood. Refinishing. And I have an entryway floor that is made of ceramic tile, but it's cracking up, and I want to put something on top of it. Okay, so um, new floor over old tile. Pardon my handwriting. I, I can't write with lowercase letters. It takes me forever. I mean, I know how I was learned. My curse was atrocious. And is there anybody that's watching at home that would, that has any questions? But I didn't hear you, Jason. I'm sorry. Okay. And they can come up with whatever name they want for me to write on the board. I always like Nitro is what I would pick if I could pick my own name. I always wanted to be a Mike when I was a kid, but Nitro would be. All right. So uh, let's get the one first that everybody has interest in, which is the hardwood floor refinishing. So one thing that's interesting with old houses is, is that you know, everything had hardwood floor or uh, some houses you would see hardwood floor around the edges. And then there's a pine area in the middle that was because it was intended to have rugs over it. Um, and pine was less expensive and it was a lot easier to work with and is more available. Um, and so if that is a situation that somebody has... Um, you know, there's things that you can do to try to stain it to match and stuff like that. But I've also seen people where they'll paint a rug on the floor and do like stencils and stuff like that. And so it's kind of all kinds of cool stuff. And you don't have to feel bad about it because you're not painting over beautiful oak and then finish the hardwood floor on the outside. Um, but it seems like all these ways that the homes were built when they were built in the 20s was at some point people wanted the newest, greatest stuff. Um, and then you know, years later, someone wanted the new greatest stuff. And now most of us would give anything just to have that house exactly how it was the day it was built. Because some things are just timeless, right? And they last. Um, I see so many houses that have hardwood floors that have, you know, not been kept up on uh, ceramic tile that, you know, maybe the tile's still in great shape, but the grout's gotten ugly or whatever. And they're just their products that last a long time stuff now um you know laminate flooring for example um you know you see like 20 year warranties and 25 and everything this is like you know this is like carpet really this is something that um I, I, costume jewelry almost it's it represents something else it's quick and it's inexpensive and you just kind of plan that you're going to replace it. it's not a forever product Hardwood floor is a forever product. I mean, you can sand it and refinish it many times um, until you get so deep into it that you start seeing the nails, um, which that that is possible if you're overdoing it. Um, and that's one area, one thing with a professional um, versus, uh, you know, a first-time person is they kind of know how, how long how many times a floor can be refinished and they know just how much to take off. Most of your old hardwood floor is going to be three quarters of an inch thick. And I'm going to tr uh, try my, what do you call uh, this camera, the overhead camera. And then I'll walk out and show you guys too. All right. So um, this is the edge profile of it. And so we have a tongue and a groove. It may or may not, depending on how old the floor is, have tongue and grooves on the end. But your nails are driven into this corner right here, going through and into the floor. So this area right here is about a quarter of an inch on the top. Is You've got quite a bit to go through before you get to where that floor is 
not able to be finished anymore. Do you see where I'm talking about? Like, so your nails are going to go right, right into that corner there. And so this is your area you've got to work with. Um, but also, if you were to sand all of this away, then your tongue and groove's gone. The floor is going to come apart. I mean, it's I've never seen uh, a floor sanded so much that it can't be sanded one more time unless it was somebody just went crazy with you know because you can rent machines with sandpaper that's like it looks like gravel on there like a 24 grit sandpaper and if you leave that thing sitting there running for five minutes it's going to make a hole and fall through to the basement i mean it's pretty aggressive and so um you know, a lot of times, uh, one thing that's going to be a consideration in having hardwood floor refinished is the surface that's on top of it. And so a lot of old floors were stained, and then they might have, you know, over the years, maybe a wax finish or a varnish finish, um, you know, or, or urethane or something was put on at some point. New floors, this floor has in it powdered aluminum oxide which is what we make sandpaper out of. Um, and it makes it super, super durable. Um, it's very difficult to sand off. And so if you have a floor that was put in, I don't know, in the last 25 or 30 years, it probably has aluminum oxide in it. Um, and it, it's gonna take an incredible amount of work to get that off from the surface. And so, um, I mean, it can be done, but Whereas one floor, you might need a couple of belts for your sander. You know, you could go through a box of them if it's the aluminum. Because you're trying to sand sandpaper. Sandpaper, essentially what you're trying to do. So um, so that's a consideration. Another consideration is, is that the stain on the floor, are you looking to just refinish it? Or are you looking to uh change the color and then refin by refinishing it i mean put a new wear layer on of um you know, you know, typically urethanes are really popular now um but so are you looking to just you know take off the old wear layer and put a new wear layer on just so you're kind of freshening it up like you wax a car or are you looking to change the color of the floor and so if you're if you want a floor that's going to be lighter than the old floor um you're going to take a lot more off. If you want a floor that's going to be darker than the old floor, um, you know, it, you don't have to take all of that all of that stain off from there. And the stain doesn't penetrate super deep, but um, it's deep enough that it's, you know, uh, you want to make sure because you get it all. Because if you get some little patches, uh, then it's, it's going to those patches are going to show up more the patches that you missed and it's going to look spotchy do you have a question i do <clears throat> so what if you pulled the carpet up and the floors are not varnished is that the correct word yeah finished finished they're not finished at all they're just dull plain wood floors okay so in that case um so what you're going to typically find in, a, in, a, in an older house, um, I'd say, uh, you know, pretty safe to say like pre-1950s, you are n almost never going to find this is OSB. Uh, some people call it chipboard. Some people, and, and there's a lot of different names, but OSB, um, and it's typically going to be three quarters of an inch. Almost everything you're going to find in, a, in an older house, like particularly in a house in this neighborhood, is going to be basically planks that look like this, um, and they're um, they may be tongue and groove, and they were put down like a hardwood floor, but a lot of them are just nailed uh, right down into the joist. Does everybody know what a joist is? The joists are your your bones. Um, and they could be different widths, um, different width boards. Sometimes they're, you know, all kind of the same, but sometimes you might find that the width is going to vary by an inch from board to board. Um, a lot of times you find them running on a diagonal. 
Um, and because uh, when they would put hardwood floor on, you don't want them both going the same direction because if this one starts to wiggle, it's just going to make it, you know, kind of like bricks, right? If you put them all straight in rows without offsetting every other course. Um, and so it's that same kind of idea. And so a lot of times you'll find the um, your substrate uh, boards are going to be running at a 45 degree and the other, uh, your, um, your hardwood flooring is going to be running at uh, a 90 degree to your, to your joist. So typically if you pull up the carpet and you see that the boards, and you see that the boards are running at a 45 degree angle, that's probably the pine substrate. And directly underneath that is the um, is the joist, and so whereas hardwood floor you've got the three quarters of an inch of substrate, and then three quarters of an inch of hardwood floor on top of it, so you'll have like an inch and a half or so, give or take a little bit of total thickness. And one way where you can tell that is if you have a vent register in the floor, um, is you just kind of like peel that sheet metal back a little bit and you can kind of see the you know the uh, like the CSI investigation of what the layers of the floor are so you can refinish um, you can refinish uh, uh, any wood um, however with um, um, when it's a substrate you want to look and see what kind of shape the boards are in because a lot of the boards could be cracked which isn't necessarily a bad thing they could be cracked down their length but they're still supporting you still got the mass there um or maybe you've got na it's nailed through the face and then you've got nails there wanting to come up and stuff so you'll just have to address that um along you know so that you you know it's one thing if you have a crack in your floor and there's carpet over it on your bare feet but if you walk over the crack itself in your bare feet you know maybe get a sliver or or whatever and so does that answer your question okay well how, how else I guess what I'm asking is do you sand it or do you varnish it like how do you finish the bare floor okay um, well sanding it depends if this if it's nailed through the if, the if you can see the nails exposed right to the board um, as a, so some of it they would nail in just like the hardwood floor into the tongue groove. Some of it's just plain straight boards, and they just nailed through the face of the board onto the joist. One thing um, that you want to take into consideration, if it's nailed straight through the board onto the joist, if you start sanding on that, uh, you could possibly start sanding the heads off some of those nails, which is once the head of the nail is gone, it's not holding it down as well. Um, so that's something that you want to take into consideration. But yeah, sand it. So a pine floor compared to a hardwood floor being, you know, your hardwood floors you're going to find is almost always going to be oak or maple. Um, pine floors are considerably softer and they're going to sand much, much, you're going to remove wood much, much quicker. Um, and so you can sand it and um, finish it. It's not going to be very durable. It's, uh, it's going to be pretty, I mean, pine's very soft. Um, and so it, it is going to be likely to dent a little bit easier. Pine's kind of hard to stain. If you want to stain it, one thing that you do, definitely want to do on pine is, uh, if you're going to stain it, is uh, there's what's called a staining sealer. And what it does is it seals the pores of the wood because, you know, the pine, depending on where on the tree, there's, um, there's parts of the wood that are softer and harder, um, and they're going to absorb stain differently. And so what can happen is, is you can stain the floor, and then you're going to end up having spots that are really dark and spots that are really light or, in, or just spotchy looking. Um, and so a sanding sealer... Uh, is going to help have that uniformity of that color on the floor. And so you put you sand on the floor, get it really clean, get all the dust off from it and everything. Then you put on the sanding sealer and just follow the directions on the on the can. Um, 
uh, some some uh, stains, you're going to want to follow the direction on the product that you're using. Are going to tell you that they suggest that you use a sanding sealer. Other ones aren't such a big deal about it. Um, and then you get into water-based stains or oil-based stains, and the same with your finishes. And um, if you're going to do something yourself, when it comes to stains and finishes, Douglas and Sons is right on Walnut Street. Um, I know that you know there's some of the box stores and stuff are supportive of us here, and I'm. But the Douglas and Sons, as every one of those people there, they know. They know everything about the product, what ones are compatible, which ones are going to work best for you, depending on what you're going over and everything like that. And, and so um, I'm not a Finnish guy. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I kind of have a basic knowledge from my general woodworking, but I haven't refinished very many hardwood floors. Uh, I've got a floor sander, but I always just used it to flatten out the floor that where there was joints that are higher and stuff like that before I put the flooring on. That's all I used it for. But it's just like having a pickup truck that, you know, your buddies find out you've got one and, oh, can you help me? You know, it's like, it's, you know, people, if you got a truck, everyone wants to help you, help them move, right? Well, it's just, you know, oh, can you come over and help me refinish my floors? And it's like, well, I really don't know. But, I mean, I'll help you, but it's like there's no guarantees. You know, I mean, I'll stand behind it if I put it in as a pre-finished floor. But when it comes to if, you, if, you, if you're 100% that you want it done right, I'm not the guy. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell them, call, you know, call, call real wood floors. And, uh, but, you know, it's, you know, flipping a house or something like that. It's like, I'll give you a try. I'll help you. But, you know, don't come looking at me if it doesn't turn out good, you know. And, um, but yeah, so for finishes, I always tell people just Douglas and Sons, tell them what you're looking to do. And they're going to tell you, because, I mean, they carry a lot of different products. And, and that's for a reason. You know, it's not like you're going to go in and they say, oh, this is the best one we got, blah, 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 here it is. And so well, why is it the best one that we got? And they might have had a training from that vendor, right? And the, their propaganda minister came and told them why this particular stain is the best one. And so they're just regurgitating that to you. Um, but they're going to, you know, I mean, there's a reason why there's different stains and different finishes and um, and they're going to be able to tell you why that is. And the other thing, too, is when you look at this stuff, it can be, it, it can look expensive when you start thinking, you know, looking at, you know, $50, $60, $70, $100 a gallon or whatever. But when you look at how far it goes and the cost of the overall project, one thing I would suggest is spend the money and get the best finish that you can afford because, the difference between a good finish and a bad finish is, you know, one, how well it looks, how easy it's to put on, but two, are you going to be refinishing this floor in three years or ten years? And they can tell you what that is, but, you know, it's, so that would be my suggestion. Um, but I just, you really caution to be careful. Uh, if there's, if you see the nail heads that you don't, end up sanding through make sure that they're all uh, um, you can get a nail set and a hammer you know then you hit and drive them down a little bit just to make sure they're good and tight and the other thing is as I know from sanding you know typically everything that we were going over when I was doing floors was OSB on new homes so they build the house they build the deck it's just out in the rain while it's being framed and all the ends soak up water and they all kind of peak like that and so I would just run down those with my drum sander and flatten those out before I started putting down. We've got a question online. Awesome. Are you ready for a question online or do you, are you finishing up there yet? Uh, if, if I'm not done answering this one in 30 seconds, okay. tell me and I, okay. so, but you always, uh, you'd always, I'd always really have to make sure that I'm not sanding down through nail heads 
to make that end up being a loose thing, uh, a loose joint. So hammer those down good and um, and then just go from there. And the other thing too is every time you catch one of those nail heads sticking up, it's going to catch that uh, that sandpaper and tear it up on the sander. It's easy. It's just to hire hire it done really. Okay, question online. Question online. Lynn says, my 1896 house was student housing for 20 years, and I've spent the past 12 years trying to fix all the neglected and remuddling the landlords committed. The living room floor was sanded, refinished sometime before I bought the house, and the professionals who have seen it say it's not able to be sanded any further. There are deep gouges and the edges of the boards near the doors are chipped off. Do you have any repair suggestions such as removing the worst boards and inserting new ones or what? So um, without seeing the floor, of course, take it with a grain of salt. But um, so boards can be replaced. Um, depending on how thick your floor is, is uh, going to be a consideration of if your floor is too thin already, um, then to, uh, a standard board is going to be three quarters of an inch. Um, and so you're going to have to get something that's smaller than that, but still has, um, you know, a tongue and groove on it. And then there's, when you replace a plank, essentially what you're going to do is I'm going to use this camera, Jason. There we go. Okay, so here we are. So this is, say that this is your, there's our shortest board. This is in the middle of some other boards. And say that we need to replace this plank. We want to take it out. So um, the way it is in now is you've got nails in each of these each of these corners where the groove meets the, the vertical or the tongue meets the vertical part of the face. Um, and you've got it mechanically with the tongue and groove in there so you can't just lift it out. If you ladies would like to come up here you could see better. You're welcome to. And so, you know, we also have another board here, another board here we're imagining. So what you have to do is to remove a board. Uh, if it's on an end and there's nothing going to it, uh, it's going to be a little bit easier than if it's in the middle, but the process is still pretty much the same, that you're going to need to separate and take a portion of this board out so that you can then move those together so it fits out, which you can do by um, drilling drilling a couple of holes all the way through uh, until you hit your substrate, and then using a circular saw, cut. Can I draw on these? Sure. All right. So you're going to cut a cup drill a couple of holes and then take a circular saw and cut a couple of lines here now this piece is going to come out nice and easily and then you can get into taking a chisel kind of chopping this out a sharp chisel uh, until you end up getting all of this out and you want to be mindful not to damage the two boards on the end because next thing you know you're replacing all kinds of boards um, so you nibble this out here with a chisel um, you can drill your holes closer to the edge if you want just make sure you give yourself enough room that with your circular saw that you're not going to be damaging the board on, on the other ends um, and so 
And once you get that out, uh, if you get your get in there with a pry bar, um, a, a small narrow pry bar, or even a screwdriver, um, you're going to be able to to tell pretty easily which one which edge has the tongue and which edge has the groove, because the edge with the groove is going to come up really easily because all it is 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 it's not fastened other than overlapping the tongue on the other side the edge with the tongue has got the nails in it and that is going to be the one that's a little bit harder to come out so the edge with your groove um you'll be able uh to you know typically take a, a chisel um and we're going to pretend this is a chisel And we're going to pretend, sure, but this will work. Um, as long, so this, imagine this is a chisel, and so uh, that chisel is going to get a bite in there, and you're just going to take your hammer, and you're going to kind of tap, 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 and until the, that comes out, the groove side, that comes out. Now the tongue side get a, a small pry bar this is your standard i think it's 12 inches um it is 12 inches um this will give you a lot of force but it's, if you have a two inch uh, like a two inch wide plank you might not really have the room to get this in there and so my lovely assistant um this is a smaller this is a smaller one. It's going to be a lot easier to get in there, but it's not going to be as sturdy. Um, but because it's only nailed in on this one end, um, you'll be able to kind of wiggle this in there. You might need to use a hammer to get it under there. And once you start getting it up a little bit, then you should be able to get uh, a bigger one in there. And just make sure that, say, this is our existing board that we don't want to damage. That you just put a little piece of wood or something it's also going to give you some more leverage um and then you just generally kind of wiggle this don't just try to rip it right up because you could end up damaging this board but you just kind of wiggle this back and forth until those nails get loose and then you'll start to see a gap and then you do the similar thing as just kind of tap tap and get it out of there and so now once we've got it out of there now we have to put a new board in and so uh, we want to make sure that um, that we've got our edges um, are nice and straight and the um, and that they're the right length to uh, you know you don't want a big gap but it needs to be small enough that it'll go in there so um, you're uh, you're gonna um, you're gonna typically go ahead and um, take off the end tongue if there's one on there um, and then you're going to so okay this is like backing up a trailer so right here is the groove side on the long edge of the wood on the bottom of this groove you've got one piece on the top you got one piece on the bottom we're going to take a and you can do this with a chisel if you're not comfortable doing it with i mean ideally if you're on a usually if you're doing a repair your tools aren't set up and everything and so you can do this with a chisel and just take it right off from there or a skill saw or a table saw if you've got it but you want to take that bottom piece off and so that now um, that groove can go in there or the tongue will fit in the old one from before and it will drop in because otherwise how are you going to get the tongue and the groove to go back together right um, it'll drop in but before you do that um, uh, go ahead and go ahead and dry fit it first and um, you know, when you're dry fitting it 
to make sure is you can use a couple uh, uh, like a couple pieces of blue tape like just on the edge and it's not going to just drop right in there or it shouldn't um, but it'll get close enough that with a little tapping you should be able to get it to go in there um, if you need to you can take after you've got this bottom one cut off um, is you could take like a, a plane or a knife or a file and this little edge right here is you can kind of taper that a little bit of a 45 well you want to be careful that you don't take too much off because then it becomes a weak sharp edge um, but once you know it's going to be a good um, once you know it's going to be a good uh, that, that's going to fit um, then you put some glue and this stuff is exactly what I used when I was working on floors anytime I needed to glue something down this they have but like pretty much everywhere but it's PL 400 it's a heavy-duty construction adhesive um, it's made for floors uh, floor deck inside and out this is what they use when they build your house and they're putting your uh, your your OSB substrate onto your joists a lot of times it doesn't once it dries it does not come off and so but you get some of that um, and uh, before you go to work with the glue just make sure this is covered up maybe some painters tape or something because the stuff like you'll cut the end of it off and then start using it and then once you got enough out then it wants to keep coming out kind of thing so just be prepared that you don't get it all over the place um, and then uh, and you don't have to use that much like you know kind of like a like that kind of thing um, is, is gonna do the trick and then get because you don't want so much in there that's gonna keep it from wanting to come up but most of your flooring is gonna have grooves in the bottom and so a lot of your excess is gonna fit into that bottom into those grooves right there um, and so you get it in there and then you know tap 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 down with a hammer get something heavy uh, oh and you're gonna put like a piece of like pine or something you're not gonna hit it directly with the hammer because now you got another plank to replace now it's glued down um, so you know put a pine block or something over top of that or use a rubber mallet if you got it and then just set something heavy on top of it and um, let it sit overnight and and there you go um, another thing to consider too is wood is going to expand and contract width wise with the change of the seasons quite a bit and so it's typically going to be much easier to replace a plank during the winter time when the woods contracted and dry than in the most humid part of the summer and um, but what you definitely want to do is the plank that you're replacing you want that to be sitting in the room for I would suggest at least a week um, prior to trying this because otherwise what you find out is is that you ended up either putting in a board that was a lot drier and now it starts expanding and you get you know uh, starts trying to push the other boards apart because it was drier than the other boards or it ends up you had to trim it and now it shrinks a little bit and you've got a big gap there so kind of let the tightness of the boards are down there already kind of be your judge look at it. I mean if there's because wood floor a lot of older wood floors people say oh, I've got gaps in my floors and I said all the time and they said what do you mean I said summer or winter and I said well I don't know I just noticed it now and but you know a lot of stuff is you know in the winter time you'll end up with a little bit of gaps in the summertime you don't have the gaps because the woods and the woods always gonna expand width wise almost never lengthwise because you've got a whole bunch of straws is what the grain of the wood is and so they're gonna go like that um, I mean there is a lengthwise uh, expansion but it's it's you need micrometers to measure it right um, and so it's always gonna expand which width wise which is where when you come up to a wall you'll always find that the, the rule of thumb I was always told was the thickness of the wood away from the wall that there's a gap that's covered by trim that allows that and this is especially true with um, like these modern laminate floors uh, so I'm sorry Lynn did I answer your question 
and I apologize. I don't know if that's what you signed on for was that lecture or not, but I can keep going if you want. Oh, perfect. You got it. Um, So the question is, if you have pet stains, is it better to replace the entire board or to stain over it? So my answer to that would be it depends. Um, and so um, if it's, so there's a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one is, is the look and the other is the odor and then the other could be the damage of the floor. Um, if it's over a large area, um, then I would certainly say, and it's like a really, really bad stain and it smells and everything like that, then I would strongly consider replacing that area. Um, one thing that a lot of times people would ask is, is they say, well, I've got um, my dog or my cat. Um, you know, when we first got her or got him and he was a puppy, um, and they went to the bathroom on the carpet. They don't, you know, they don't do it anymore. But, and then I say, well, can you smell it uh, once the carpet's torn out? And more often than not, with a good cleaning, you can't, um, unless it was really long term. And then it's, at that point, there's really nothing you're going to do to seal it in or get rid of it other than replace planks. But, the an animal's sense of smell is so much better than ours that um, I've heard a theory that makes sense to me, and I have no science to back it up. But is that sometimes an animal, once they have their scent there, they're satisfied that they have claimed this is my house or whatever. Um, and as long as you can't smell it, um, then I would say, you know, clean it till you're comfortable. Uh, but, you know, when you start putting multiple layers of shellac over it, um, which is going to seal in, uh, it's going to help to seal it in. Um, it's not going to help the appearance of it. But, um, you know, the more you remove that scent, then the more the animal is going to feel compelled to mark again. That's my theory, I mean, it's, and it's not even my theory. It's the theory that somebody else told me, and I don't remember who they were to give them credit, but, but it makes sense to me. Um, and so if it comes to a floor being, um, unless something sat for quite a long time, especially if there's already a, somewhat of a finish on the floor, um, it would have to happen repeatedly over a long period of time before it really makes the floor look bad to where it doesn't get sanded off easily. Yeah. Right, because it's not going to soak that far into the floor. As far as a hardwood floor goes, now a pine, a pine floor, um, I mean, the pine's really going to soak it up a lot because it's like a sponge, but um, yeah, so um, I don't think that is, if, if it's visually gone, and this is something that I would I would ask the people at the paint store about because they know better about it than I do. Um, one thing I do know with oak is um, oak, cherry, and walnut are also, um, like when I was doing tile work, if you're grouting tile and you have unfinished oak anything, um, and you have even the slightest amount of iron in the water, and you hit the oak with that, it's going to turn it black. And so, in fact, there's um, a lot of people have a process that they do called ebonizing, where that's desirable, where they dissolve steel wool into vinegar and then use that to darken the wood. Um, and, you know, and so basically it comes down to like acid and iron. And so if you've got acid, um, 
you know, and then you've got like around the nails and stuff like that, uh, where there might be tax strip or whatever, you'll see like black spots. Um, and so that's a whole different um, can of worms there. So, and then, you know, getting to that as well. Um, so tearing up carpet and putting in or refinishing a hardwood floor, um, you're going to find a number of things. One is uh, if there's padding down, it was stapled, you know, at the padding typically comes six foot wide and so it's stapled all the way around where the padding was down underneath and then you've got the tack strip around the edge um, and just from the moisture and the iron and the nails um, those when you pull that tack strip out you're going to have those spots that are going to be dark and there's nothing you can do about that other you know fill them I just say fill them and go it's character it's you know um, but to obsess over wanting them to be invisible it's just not going to happen so does that is Lynn answered she's she's probably sitting there with her head spinning like I thought it was going to be a sentence so yeah so if it is too thin to replace it's if it's too thin it's too thin I mean that's just gouges um not really uh now dents on the other hand carefully you can use um like low setting of steam with like a steamer and uh like put like a wet rag over it this is a floor that's finished if it's an unfinished floor then we get into the finished meaning it has a surface on it if it's an unfinished floor um it's going to absorb the moisture better, but we run, if you are going to do it, and if you have to do it on a floor, it's unfinished, use distilled water so you don't have the iron in there and stuff like that because um, you are going to have probably have a mark to remove um, afterwards, but you can add steam to take minor dents out or at least make them not as bad. You're never really going to get them out, out, um, but if you do that prior to sanding, it might raise them up enough that it's going to, yeah, and the worst dents I've seen on hardwood floors are when somebody wheels a piano on these little bitty steel wheels. And the thing weighs like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Um, and so you get that trail over the piano where the refrigerator got moved. So, okay. So we're moving on. And. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. Okay. So. Um, hardwood floor refinishing, are we all good with? Are we all good with hardwood floor refinishing? Okay. Moisture barrier and substrate, uh, which would, uh, and then we'll, we'll roll this right up into a burrito along with a new floor over ceramic tile. Um, So moisture barrier is going to be, yeah. you can, uh, so a moisture barrier, I am, that post is right between you and I, isn't it? So a moisture barrier is going to, uh, you know, it's, it's not moisture proof, it's moisture resistant or it's going to help slow it down. And so the first question is, if you need to put a moisture barrier down, is why do you need to put a moisture barrier down? Um, so going over concrete with, so this really wasn't much of a thing until, because it used to be that you just said, basically, if you have anything below grade, um, then you just can't put wood floor in because you can't nail into it and, or, you, you know, you could build up the floor, but, um, and then the laminate floor started getting really popular. And so these have like a, a, a sawdust core that's glued together. Typically there's some that have a plastic core. And so um, one thing I would suggest if you're concerned about moisture and you're looking at a product like this is try to find something that, ha that has a, a plastic type core that's going to be um, less susceptible to moisture. Um, and so the next thing is, so for as moisture barrier goes, um, on concrete, there's acceptable moisture and there's unacceptable moisture, So uh, which could be from geological features of you know water aquifer or near a lake or whatever 
So one thing that you want to do is get an area that's nice and clean and dry uh, on your concrete surface and take about a three foot by three foot thick visqueen piece of plastic, um, put it down, duct tape around the edges, leave it there for 72 hours, peel it back. If that has discolored, um, as opposed to the rest of the floor considerably, then you've got a lot of moisture that's coming through your concrete. Because I mean, concrete is not a barrier. You know, things pass back and forth through it. Um, now, typically, if you get to a point where it's noticeably discolored or you even got like a, like dew kind of underneath there, at that point, I'm going to say don't put a wood product under there because no matter what you do, you've got enough humidity in there that it's not going to work out very well. Um, so that being said, um, now if it's not discolored in that little three foot area, then, you know, essentially just put a visqueen uh, down. And so we're talking about moisture from coming up from underneath, not moisture from the top. Was your question about moisture from the top or moisture from the bottom? Oh, from the bottom. Okay. And so um, you're still going to want to go ahead and put a moisture barrier down if you're using a wood type product. Um, bear in mind, we talked about having the expansion gap around the edge, particularly something like this, is you really need to honor that. And um, the bigger the better kind of thing. You know, figure out what your baseboard is. And then maybe even if it's a area that you're concerned about it, plan on putting a shoe molding on top of, you know, both shoe molding and a baseboard, which is going to give you like, you know, more like close to an inch um, and kind of grow that expansion gap. And so when you see these laminate floors where you go in and they're just like all like, you know, this is exaggerated, but, you know, like that, um, that's just because of moisture. And then you're also going to find in front of a dishwasher or a refrigerator. Um, God forbid you have a leak. Uh, of your ice maker um, or your dishwasher and that water is going to find its way under there no matter what you do. Um, that's why we have insurance. I mean, I mean, you know, stuff like that. I mean, a tree, I mean, you can do whatever you want to try to protect your house from a tree, but that's why you've got insurance, right? Um, but um, there's, so you just want to use a layer of Visqueen. The manufacturer of the product is going to tell you what to use. It's typically going to be their brand, and it's going to be more expensive than just Visqueen because it's got their name on it. But the thing is, is that as soon as you have a problem and you didn't use their stuff, then you're on your own. Um, and so um, I would just say follow directions. As long as if, if you have that discoloration under your piece of plastic, that I'm as much as I need to say it, don't put a product in that's not. And so as opposed to this, this is getting a lot less popular now because what's come out now is what's called luxury vinyl tile, which is like this, except it's solid PVC vinyl. And so um, it's some of it is uh, more and more of it's now tongue and groove because originally you had to glue it down. Gluing it down is like a adhesive that you put it down and then you got to let it sit for a little bit until it, isn't wet, but it's tacky, and it's just miserable. Uh, I always suggest going with the snap together if you're doing it yourself. It was kind of gimmicky at first, but it's become to where, I mean, it's there's people that have patents just on on these, uh, on the profile of those snap together things so it's um they put a lot of research into them and they work well and they go together much easier um and another nice thing too is even though it's like luxury vinyl tile is that it's because you don't have everything glued together you've kind of got a little bit of wiggle room for expansion and so this will go so far and then you got to snap it but if you look at this really close you can't, I, you can't even see it without, if you have better eyes than I do, but if you look at that really close, there's still a, a little bit of air in that joint that could be that little bit of, 
the room for some expansion and contraction. Did that answer your question or? Perfect. So you want to know about going over ceramic tile in an entryway. I do, but I don't mind answering it after class or in part two of flooring repair if you're willing to come back and do a part two. I'll do as many parts as you want. As you can tell, I like to talk, so um, yeah. So I don't mind, because it's my question, I don't mind waiting and I don't mind asking after class. And it also gives our viewers the opportunity to tune back in for part two of Mr. Paul Rucker's flooring repair. So, Mr. Paul, I wanted to say thank you. I wanted to say thank you for all of you that joined in, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. I had a great time.